So infrared thermography, um, this is the kind of the, the sixth method that you'll be doing in lab. This is the last method that will actually be doing practical activities uh, surrounding. And I'll demo, I will demo this method when we get back from uh, spring break. So I'm not going to do it next week because of the midterm, we'll do it after spring break. This is a relatively new NDT method. This is the newest of any of the methods that you're going to perform. Um, and it's there's always, you know, people are always looking, when, you, when you're doing your research projects, you'll probably see um, there's a lot of research out there and new methods, new techniques, and we're trying to, um, we're trying to look at materials better, we're trying to make things safer. And this is one, this, when, when infrared thermography came out, it was a huge step in that process. Um, and so it's a limit, when I say limitations of the big six, I'll talk about what those are here in just a second. Um, but the big six are uh, the ones that are most of those methods we talked about so far. So visual inspection, remote visual inspection, liquid penetrant, magnetic particle, eddy current, ultrasound. And then the, what we're going to talk about once we wrap this up is um, radiography and x-ray. Okay, so those are your big six. And then now infrared thermography makes seven. What really drove this was the adoption of new materials in the form of composites because there are limitations with all these other methods that, that make them not ideal for composites. Um, it also has allowed some of the other advantages we found is it increases speed and ease of inspection. Uh, this is uh, infrared thermography can be done as what's called wide area inspection so we can look at large areas all at once. Um, it can provide some very clear and obvious results and it's very safe for both the aircraft uh, and the inspector. So there's the, when I say the big six, there's the list again. And so just some of the limitations, eddy current mag particle are limited to um, magnetic, or sorry, metal parts, you know, metallic parts, right? Mag particle limited to ferromagnetic parts, parts only, right? So that, again, composites can't really do either of those. Liquid penetrant and ultrasound have a lot of limit, limited capability when it comes to composites. Uh, for, you know, you can't really use li liquid penetrant. You don't want it soaking into like the fibers inside the plastic. Remember a composite, you've got fibers that are embedded in plastic. Um, or ultrasound, uh, because there's so many different materials all encased together, you get a lot of, um, a lot of interference. You have all those acoustic uh, interfaces that cause a lot of bounce back. Um, ultrasound, as you're learning now, as you're doing it, some of you have started it, you'll see that it's fairly slow. You can only do a small area. And that applies to uh, eddy current as well. I could also put that up with eddy current. You know, eddy current is fairly slow, small area. You're limited to smaller areas. X-ray is extremely expensive and potentially dangerous. Just to give you an idea, I've looked at what would it take to add X-ray here. A basic X-ray cabinet to be able to do parts about the size of my clicker, maybe a little bit bigger would be about $250,000. So, you know, you can see where it's prohibitively expensive, and that's for a very basic rudimentary model for just learning how to do the basics. Plus, potentially dangerous, we're dealing with radiation in various forms, whether it's um, X-ray radiation or iso radioisotope radiation. And then detailed and remote visual inspection, surface view required, you have to access port or have access ports, like in an engine, for instance. Um, and all, you know, a lot of these two are based on uh, visual interpretation. Okay, so limited by eyesight. And that, again, li limited by eyesight or visual interpretation, that also can apply to some extent to x-ray. It can apply to liquid penetrant. It can apply to magnetic particle. Uh, so, you know, anything that, that uses your eyes as your primary means of making a determination is prone to human error. Uh, you know, fairly high probability of human error. Or relatively high. So the advantages when we're looking at thermography, infrared thermography as an, op as, as an option, where those advantages come in is they address a lot of those concerns that we see in those other methods. Um, so the, the primary driver, once this equipment became available, was to test composite materials uh, and be able to evaluate their condition, particularly in service. 
You've probably heard a lot about, you know, his aircraft with the 787 still being fairly new, A350 also being new, and then other aircraft coming out, more and more composites, the Cirrus fleet that we have here at Western. Um, there was a lot of concern. As, as someone who was kind of studying the industry when, when a lot of these composite aircraft came out, there was a lot of concern about there is how are we, are we going to know, are we going to be able to know when a failure is impending? Right, because these were such new materials, nobody knew how they were going to necessarily react long term. They, you know, they'd done experimentation, there had been research done on them, you know, a lot of things like that. But, you know, there's still a bit of concern when you put something new like that into service, is how's it going to behave? And we're still figuring that out. You know, these have been in service for 20 years. What's going to happen at 30 years or 40 years or even 50 years? You know, some planes are flying that long now. And so this was what techniques can we use to really evaluate composites long term. Um, but the, the nice part is it can be used on metallic structures as well. It's not just limited to composite. And it's not just composite or metallic structures. This, these techniques are often used in other industries. Um, oil and gas use them. You can use them for detecting leaks of gases and things like that. Home inspection and building inspection uses them for energy efficiency, as well as looking for like water leaks or water damage. Um, you can use them for performance of things like that, like engines. Um, they use these to, to monitor things like tires and auto racing um, and other stuff like that, engine performance, exhaust. So it's, it has a broad uh, array of applications in and out of aviation. Um, it can be used to detect both surface and subsurface flaws. It's primarily going to be for detecting subsurface flaws, but you can detect surface flaws as well, wide area surface flaws. Um, it's a relatively large inspection area when compared to methods such as ultrasonic testing or eddy current testing. Um, with a high enough resolution thermal camera, you can scan entire flight control surfaces at once or large areas of a fuselage, for instance. Uh, and there's a very high degree of safety. We don't have any radiation involved. Um, there's no chemicals involved. You don't have to deal with safety data sheets and all that kind of thing. Uh, you do have to do some heating and cooling, but even that can be done passively using things like the sun or just the fact that a plane's cold when it comes back from flying, so you don't have to do any special heating or cooling. Um, the, other, the other safety thing that's there is that oftentimes it can be done from the ground because it is such a wide area thing. You can scan fairly large sections of the aircraft without having to get up on it and having a fall risk uh, or, or need any kind of fall protection or scaffolding or different safety equipment in that manner. And so it's, it's a great tool for that. And what we're seeing more and more is these cameras are really easy to install on a drone. And so they're using drones to actually fly around large aircraft uh, to say inspect the tail, you know, inspect the rudder and the stabilizers and the elevators and all that stuff. So um, kind of some neat things here. They're very lightweight, very small, easy to put onto a drone or a crawler or however robotic device. Okay, the functional theory. What is, how does this work? Why, why can we use this? So the functional theory is a properly laminated or bonded material, okay? And it doesn't have to be a homogeneous material. Think of a composite. It, it's, it's got a lot of different materials in there that are all bonded together. Um, but a properly laminated or bonded material has a relatively uniform and known thermal characteristics. That is, heat can either conduct through it, it can transfer through it. it. There's a certain amount of heat capacity in a given material, which is the quantity of heat that a given material can absorb um, from the environment when there's a temperature change. And then there's a certain, we know what's called thermal diffusivity, and that's the ability of a material to conduct thermal energy relative to storing thermal energy. So a material that's more, uh, that has higher diffusivity, it's easier to get heat in and out of that object. It's going to move in and out quicker than a material that has um, a low diffusivity, but maybe a high heat capacity. You, know, it can, you can heat it up really hot, uh, but then it holds heat for a long time. Okay? Think of like a brick. You heat a brick up really hot, it's going to stay hot for a while. Okay? 
or you think of something like aluminum foil. Has anyone pulled aluminum foil out of their oven? Just plain aluminum foil, what can you do? 400 degree oven, you can reach in, grab the aluminum foil, pull it out, and it's not gonna, typically not gonna burn you. 400 degree brick, you reach into your oven and try to pull it out, it's gonna burn you, right? So that's, that's your difference, and one's gonna diffuse heat a lot quicker, one has a lot higher heat capacity, and then the last end conductive. So what happens is, and particularly in uh, composite structures, is disbonds, delaminations, and inclusions of foreign substances have anomalous or different thermal signatures and can be located when your temperature or your heat conditions are correct, okay, or right. That's kind of the quote that summarizes. So if we have something that is affecting the ability for heat to move through or across or into or out of an object, we can see that with a thermal sensor, an infrared sensor. So it can be used for a lot of areas. These are some examples and kind of what images look like uh, with different things. So the top left there is a delamination. So that circular, that has a circular delamination between plies or between layers of a fabric. Um, voids are an air pocket. Impact damage, you can see an impact damage. A delamination typically is more smooth. Uh, it's a simulated delamination. But impact damage, you get a very, um, a very kind of jagged outline, right? Um, even during like uh, uh, repair process or manufacturing, if you want to see fiber orientation and those strength characteristics, you can find fiber orientation. Additional disc bonding there. Uh, excessive glue. This is in a um, in a uh, hex uh, a honeycomb type structure. Your honeycomb with layers of fiberglass on each side. You don't want the honeycomb pockets filled with with uh, filled with epoxy because it'll make it heavy. But you can see areas. The what's happening is they're putting heat on one side, and the areas in red are where there's a lot of the uh, a filled honeycomb, a filled cell in the honeycomb structure, is going to conduct heat a lot faster than a, a cell that mainly is filled with air. But, you know, one that's filled with a solid um, epoxy. Water ingress, and I'll show some better pictures of that. Water stays cold. As, as an object heats up, water stays cold. As an object cools down, the water stays warm. Um, spot weld, metal, corrosion, contamination. The one on the bottom right is from a bottling plant. So looking at fluid level in a pop can. Right? As you fill it with cold fluid, you can see it cools down. The blue is the cold liquid, soda or water, or whatever, inside of a bottle. Okay. So to understand thermography, we need some terminology that we got here. So first off is understanding heat. And heat is a form of energy, at its core, it's a form of energy that is transferred by a difference in temperature. But to understand that, we need to know what temperature is. So temperature is the measurement of average kinetic energy of the molecules in an object or system. So we've all heard that. As objects heat up, the molecules in them vibrate around. And molecules inside or atoms inside of an object are always moving. The warmer the object, the more, the faster they're moving. Okay? The cooler the object, the slower they're moving. And if you have an area where you have fast moving molecules here with a lot of kinetic energy and cold moving molecules over here, that energy wants to even itself out. Okay, we want to reach an equilibrium. And so that heat, that energy is going to transfer from the hot areas to the cold areas, but it's not going to happen right away. It's going to take time to transfer. And so with an infrared camera, we can watch that process happen. We can see with those differences. And over time, we can see how that heat transfers. And that's what allows us, if as, as energy moves through different materials at different density, a different heat conductivity and things like that, we can watch that process happen. And things like a disk bond, you know, these different features I was showing are because that heat transfer is taking place at different rates. Heat's going to transfer slower through air than it is through water in a void, or than a solid in the void. It's going to transfer slower into and out of water than it is um, a fiberglass composite, like what's shown on water, and so on. When we 
when we're looking at these, we need something to compare them to. And so scientists have come up with something called a black body. Okay? And a black body is a, is a perfect absorber, absorber of emitted radiation. So I'm sure you've all, everyone stood out in the sun, right? And you feel that nice warm heat on your skin. The sun is emitting energy. You are absorbing it. Okay? Your skin feels warm, you're absorbing it. You're absorbing some of it, but your skin is reflecting some of it as well. Not all of it's being absorbed, okay? And then it's transferring into your body, that's how you feel it. A black body, a true perfect black body is going to absorb every bit of energy that touches it, every bit of heat energy that hits it, okay? There's very few things that are a true perfect black body. They make some special ones when we're calibrating thermal cameras they make these black, their boxes, the inside of them are painted and the, the latest material, how many of you have heard of Vanta Black? You haven't heard of Vanta Black, but you had no idea what it would be used for? That's what they're used for. That's a perfect example. Vanta Black is a carbon nanotube pigment that is the blackest black known at the time, blackest black. I think they've come out with something new. That's a little bit blacker, but it's an almost perfect absorber of visual radiation. It's also an almost perfect absorber of infrared radiation. So you take this box, you paint it on the inside with a really dark black material, you heat it to an exact temperature, and when you point your camera inside of it, you can see what that temperature is. And you use it to calibrate, you, know, you can use it to calibrate these. But a black body is a perfect absorber, and then emitter also means it's gonna let that energy over time, it's gonna absorb whatever hits it, and then it's going to let it back off into the environment over time. Okay. And that comes into a term that's very important in, in infrared thermography, and that is emissivity. And emissivity is the ratio of, whoops, the ratio of the amount of ra electromagnetic radiation emitted by an object compared to a perfect black body. Okay. So a perfect black body has an emissivity of one. It's a zero to one scale or a zero to 100% scale. So a black body is going to only emit. It's not going to reflect any radiation. Okay. So then we have to, in order to accurately, or for a camera, a thermal camera to accurately judge temperatures, we need to know how much energy coming off of that, off of the object is the energy coming back out of it being emitted versus how much of it is being reflected from the surrounding environment, okay? And a perfect black body is a, is a one. It's gonna have 100% emission and no reflection, okay? A perfect reflector has an emissivity of zero, right? It's, it's zero compared to that. Now, we are talking in the infrared spectrum though and we'll look at spectrums in a minute. So if we compare this to the visual spectrum, in the visual spectrum, if we talk about visual emissivity, okay, that Vanta black paint, that's an emissivity of one, okay? Sorry, of, of, that's an emissivity of zero in the visual spectrum. It's an emissivity of one in, the, uh, in, our, in our infrared spectrum. A mirror, for instance, is an almost perfect reflector of visual light, right? So a mirror has a high um, emissivity of visible light, but, but it has an almost, it has a very, very low emissivity of infrared light. And so the way I can compare that is we look at um, a window. If I look out the window over here, I look out and I see a cirrus pointing at me, I can see that cirrus almost perfectly. There's almost nothing in the window behind you that blocks my view of it. So it is, a, it is a transmitter of visible light. But if I pointed a thermal camera at that window right now, I would see my body heat reflected off of it. I would see every person in this room, I'd see your body heat reflected. It would look like a mirror from a thermal perspective. Okay, so, so items can be either one. So we got it, we're, we're working in the infrared range. So just be careful that, you know, even though we can see through that glass, if we point a thermal camera at it, the thermal camera cannot see through the glass. 
it's going to see all the reflected heat. It's going to see the heat coming off of these LED lights. Even though LED lights are cool, it can pick up the temperature difference between the ceiling and the light next to it. In general, the duller and blacker material is, the closer its emissivity is to one. Okay. So, reflectivity, the amount of infrared radiation that bounces off. So, emissivity and reflectivity are, uh, sorry, emissivity and reflectivity are inverse of one another. If something is highly emissive, it means it's not very reflective. It absorbs that energy and then re-emits it. If something's highly reflective, it means the energy bounces off of it and never actually gets absorbed into the object. And then once energy gets into a material, we got to understand thermal conductivity. And that is the ability to transfer heat through an object. Okay? So think of this. Have any of you put a long stick in a bonfire? What happens when you grab the end of it that's sticking out? Anything? It's cool, right? Have any of you put a copper rod into a bonfire? And what would happen if you hit the end that was sticking out? It would hurt a bit, right? So the stick, wood, is not thermally conductive. It's not going to bring that heat from the end. Eventually it will work its way, but it'll probably burn first. Okay, whereas a copper rod, the entire, that heat's going to transfer throughout the whole length of the copper rod while it's sitting in there. Okay, so, and then finally, how fast that happens, the term that we do that is called diff diffusivity, how fast the heat diffuses, the thermal energy diffuses through a part. Okay, so it's directly related. The more conductive a part, the faster it's going to, the energy's going to diffuse. You're going to have higher diffusivity. Low thermal conductivity, low diffusivity. Okay, the diffusivity is going to—it's going to take longer for the heat to diffuse to the part. And so we can watch these different things. You know, we—if in a part that has high emissivity, we can watch the conductivity and how the heat diffuses through the part to understand if something isn't homogeneous in it. You know, where there might be a break, or a disbond, uh, or a crack or a void or something along those lines. A lot of stuff there, right? Okay. Let's back up a little bit and look at something a little more visual. So in thermography, we're going to use a special camera to measure the infrared radiation that is emitted. We want to focus on emitted radiation. And we'll talk about, I'll show you kind of a diagram in a minute. But the range there, infrared, if we look at the, the, the spectrum here from short wavelength to long wavelength or high frequency on the left to low frequency on the right, you, know, you can see we've got uh, cosmic rays on the left, gamma and x-ray, you know, our short wavelength, high frequency. Then we get into ultraviolet, which we talked about you know, with, with mag particle and liquid penetrant. We talked about using ultraviolet radiation and black lights. Now we're moving to the other side of the visible spectrum. Okay, I've got this kind of the reverse Roy G. Biv going on here. So we're, you know, instead of ultraviolet, now we're in infrared. Bigger than, or um, longer than red. So it runs in this wavelength of 0.75 micrometers, sorry, nanometers to one millimeter. Okay, wavelength wise. IR camera we're looking at is in a smaller window than that, and there's a couple different types of cameras. You'll see some that are known as mid-wave IR. Those are in the three to five um, nanometer range, and they're typically used for gas imaging. Has anyone heard of a, of a mid-wave IR camera that's been in the news a lot lately? Can't say head? No one? Anyone? No? It's uh, orbiting quite a ways away from Earth right now. James Webb Space Telescope. So that is imaging gas. It's gas imaging. It has a mid-wave IR camera on it. Okay. <laughs> like a 20-year project. So used for gas imaging, there's one of these on there. Okay. 
seven and a half to 14 uh, micrometer, sorry, nanometer, is what's called long wave infrared. And these still are very, very tiny waves, but they're a little bit longer. This is what our camera is going to detect. These are primarily heat signatures that you would feel. Okay. Um, James Webb Telescope has this range too, as well. There's several different uh, ranges of IR cameras on it. And so the IR camera, the detector in it, it's a it's a, um, a semiconductor chip similar to the camera in your phone, except tuned to infrared wavelengths instead of visible wavelengths. Um, has to be that chip has to be tuned to a certain wavelength. Okay, and so that's where we're going to be looking. So the basic process of thermography can be broken down into three steps. Um, first off, we need to do something to change or to induce a change in heat energy. So that's known as excitation or stimulation. Don't be, don't let it trip you up though. It can be, it can be heating an object. It can also be cooling an object. So you could almost say it could be excitation or de-excitation, right? Stimulation or, I don't know, what's the opposite? Um, a boring day. Um, but then we're going to measure that temperature. We're going to measure temperature over time. We're going to see how it diffuses through the object. And then we're going to analyze the results that we get from that. Now there's some additional breakdown that takes place here. So step one, stimulation. This is kind of a quick infographic and we'll go into more detail. It can be either passive or active. And there's some different ways of doing that. Okay, passive means something that we use in the environment that we're not actually uh, turning on or using specifically using energy to do. Solar radiation, ambient heat changes, that kind of thing. But we're not actually like turning an oven on to try to heat something up. Right? We're not shining light at up and then and active, there's different ways we can do optical. You know, anyone been real close to an old flash bulb, you feel the heat, right? That's infrared energy. It gives off light to help the film, but it also gives off heat. Uh, or those of you that may have been on a stage before, you feel the stage lights just cooking you, yeah. right? <laughs> That's optical heating. Uh, it's not desirable in that situation, but it's there. Um, direct contact, force convection, electromagnetic induction. And then there's some different applications for once we get the analysis. Um, we measure surface, surface changes. That's pretty much always done with a thermal camera, some form of infrared detector. And then we analyze it. We can either do raw. We've, you've probably all seen, most of you have probably seen a thermal image at some point in your life, but you'd really, you know, and you kind of knew what was going on, but you're going to really learn to, what does that mean? Um, or we can process it. We can take what all the thermal camera is doing is it's taking thousands and thousands of temperatures all at once, basically just a big grid of temperatures. You're seeing where a visual, where colors have been associated with different temperature ranges in an image, but the raw data, if you were to look at it, you can think of a giant spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers in it. You know, and that's referring to temperatures. It's a giant grid of temperatures. And so we can run processing on it and run different kinds of algorithms on it to look for patterns and look for changes that maybe aren't visible to the naked eye. And that can be used for more quantitative analysis, where direct viewing tends to be more for qualitative. So just some of these techniques that were done there. So passive solar heating, that is, if I take an object, I put it out in the sun, it's going to get warmer. Right? Anyone ever cook a hot dog with a solar oven? You guys are probably realizing how much of a nerd I was growing up. Uh, it's kind of a fun thing to do when you have kids one day. Um, so solar heating, you stand in the sun, you get warm. You stand in the shade, you cool off. We can, we can take an airplane and we can put it in the sun and then we can tow it into the hangar, which is the shade, and we can watch it cool down. Or we can take an airplane in the hangar that's cold, cool and we can pull it out into the sun and it's going to heat up. Even if it's the same roughly temp air temperature inside, outside, you know, hangar doors open. It's the heat. Now, the one thing you got to be careful there is what's going to, what do airplanes, what do you think they tend to be in addition to a 
absorbing heat, what do you think that nice white pretty paint does? It reflects a lot. So just know if you're trying to image a plane out in the sun, you're probably going to get a lot of reflection as well, which is going to throw you off. So that's why most of the time you heat them up and then bring them inside and image them as they cool down. Okay. Um, ambient heating, take it from a cold room to a hot room, take it from a hot room to a cold room, take it from inside our lab to outside where it's cold outside, take it from let it sit outside, bring it into the warm indoors, right? But we're not actively turning heat on and off uh, for the specific purpose of changing the temperature of a part. Okay, so that's why that's passive. Active, I talked about optical. We'll look at what different types of flash step or modulated means. Direct contact, you'll, it'll, it'll be kind of fun. When, I have, when we have the thermal cameras, if I stand here and then move away, you can use the thermal camera to see my footprints on the ground. Okay, that's, that's direct contact. The heat from my body, if I were to grab this, hold it for just a second, let go, there is now a temperature difference between where my hand was and where my hand wasn't. Okay, that's a direct contact for me. You can use like heat pads, you can use hot water bottles, you can use bricks wrapped in like a towel, I and mean, there's all kinds of things you can do that. Forced convection, that's like an oven that circulates air, so using warm air. Um, and electromagnetic induction, that's what we used at the factory I managed maintenance for. That's how we heated the steel up to 1400 degrees to forge it. We ran, when you run, what happens to our parts in, um, when we did mag particle inspection? Anyone notice parts get warm? Part is that from the resistance, part of it is also from the electromagnetic induction. Running a, an AC, sorry, running a um, magnetic field in and out of a part, it generates that current in there, it can cause the part to heat up. Like I said, the, the induction furnaces at the forge plane I worked at could easily, I mean, we normally heated the steel to 12 or 1400 degrees, but if someone cranked them, it could heat steel over 2000 degrees and turn it into liquid. It wasn't cool when they did that, that would then solidify inside and ruin the furnaces. So, passive tends to be used more for qualitative. So, checking the big things in, in uh, aviation, we're looking for trapped water, trapped ice and underlying structural um, techniques. So where might we see trapped water, trapped ice? What areas do you think get that? I'll show you some in a little bit. Active tends to be quantitative. So if we're looking for things like delamination, impact damage, foreign objects, say someone dropped something, you know, Boeing quality control has been in the news a lot. You're trying to figure out if they screwed something up or fluid ice inclusion. You can measure sizes, areas, depths more accurately by running algorithms that look at those numbers and look for patterns in, the, in that grid of temperatures. So here's an infrared camera and the image it produces. So this is, they've taken, the camera basically has taken a bunch of a grid of temperatures and it's overlaid colors. What do you think those colors are? Any idea? Pink is hot. Yep. Blue is cold. Blue is looking at the sky. If you're not looking at the sun, the sky is very, very cold. You look out into space, it's really cold. Okay. If you look at the sun, it's really, really hot. Do not. You will be using these outside. Do not point them at the sun. They are not designed to measure that much heat you will burn the sensors on them. It will ruin the camera. So any idea what that might be right there? Water? What, what do you think that is on a, on a transport aircraft right there? An abnormality? What was kind of behind you in the flight deck of the 727? You got circuit breaker panels and avionics located right in that area. They tend to give off a lot of heat. Not a lot of heat, the difference there may not be that big, honestly. It might be a fra few fractions of a degree. But these cameras can measure down to about a third of a degree Fahrenheit. Okay. 
why, why are there these lines here? Where the structure is behind that structure behind that metal is going to transfer heat better than the air in the areas between you know most of this area is just skin with air behind it and then you have structure where you got more metal transferring more heat into that area okay so again the raw we were we were direct viewing an infrared image um, we will do as part of lab you will do something called thermal tuning and that is adjusting uh, essentially adjusting the range, the color palette, and other things about how we display it, but it's not actually performing any calculations on, on the image. Okay, so thermal tuning, what you'll do, direct viewing and then thermal tuning, that's still considered raw. It's just thermal tuning is adjusting kind of how your software or your camera makes the picture that you see. Okay, but it's not actually analyzing the individual pixels, the individual temperature numbers. Processed is where that thermal signal is, each individual temperature is processed and compared to the ones that are around it, okay? And sometimes maybe you multiply, you take like the average or the standard deviation and you multiply all your pixels to get a, a bigger spread to get more contrast between hot areas and cold areas artificially or where you lock in certain pixels, certain temperatures, and then adjust others to get more uh, contrast. And there are some very, very sophisticated algorithms that have been developed to find very specific cases and materials. <clears throat> kind of mentioned this already. So process, raw, trapped water ice and delamination, and quantitative. Quantitative is really cool because of these last, the second to last one right here, automated detection. These can be set up. They can feed these numbers, these values, into uh, into an algorithm or even art, you know, even AI at this point. And that can be designed to trigger and provide an output if something is off without human intervention. Okay, so these are you'll see them used. Uh, the place where I went to get trained in this, they used it for production lines where they would heat seal packaging. And they can monitor the heat sealing of plastic packaging based on as soon as, as, soon as the heaters pull away, they take a thermal image of that heat sealed plastic and they can determine how well it's, uh, if it's completely sealed, how well it's sealed, what the strength of that, of that bond is gonna be, and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. 